This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against our nation, espionage. You pick up your newspaper, today's newspaper, June 8th, 1945, and you read that FBI agents have captured a spy. The story will tell he was captured and even carry some details of his work. But there is never a report of how the case started, of how the FBI learned of the existence of the spy. Well, how do they learn? What makes them suspicious? What is the first indication that a spy is at work? Actually, it can be almost anything. Something as melodramatic as two men landing on the eastern seaboard in a small boat. Something as obvious as blueprints stolen from an office. Or something as casual, as everyday, as innocent as a letter. A letter returned to a housewife in Seattle. A letter returned to a housewife who had not written it. Good morning, Junior. Hmm? Oh, oh, good morning, dear. Eggs and cereal for me and anything else you've got. I feel as though I could eat a horse. Yeah. Mm. Ah. Say, what's that letter got that I haven't? This is the funniest thing, Harvey. Huh? It came in the mail this morning, but I don't think it's really for me. <laughs> the name on the envelope might be a clue. No, I- I'm serious, Harvey. Well, who sent it? I did, but actually I, I didn't. <laughs> Julia. No, look, dear, it has my name, Mrs. Julia Gorham, on the return address, and it was returned to me, but I didn't write it. What? Yet I could have written it. Tell us about my taking that trip to Fort Ord to see Bobby. And about going to the blood bank. Oh, Julia. Harvey, I didn't write it. Look, it's typewritten, and you know I can't type. Well, this is your signature, though. Yes, it's my signature, and I... I do collect dolls, and I bought some new ones, just as it says. But I did not write this letter. All right, all right. Harvey, is this your idea of a joke? <sighs> Julia, you know I... Well, then who did write it? And why my name, and why all about me? Well, who was it sent to? Some man I never even heard of. Maybe he doesn't even exist, because, look, the letter has address unknown stamped on it. See, here. Right here. Mm-hmm. This letter was sent to Argentina. Well? I don't know, but... Julian, maybe we better turn this letter over to the post office. Or even the FBI. FBI? Yeah. But, but why? Well, I don't know what it is, but... I don't think it's a practical joke or an accident. I think that... I think there's something funny going on with this letter, Julia. A short time later, a woman in San Francisco received a letter. A letter returned from Argentina, a letter signed with her own name. A letter she had not written. She gave the letter to the post office, and soon it was in the hands of the FBI. Because the postal authorities, like all authorities in this country, cooperate completely with the FBI. Oh, hello, Dan. Hello, Paul. I was just going to drop in on you. Have a chair. Thanks. I finished comparing the Seattle letter and the San Francisco one. That's good, because there's another now. What? It just came in. Where from this time? Springfield, Ohio. Oh, this is really turning into something, isn't it? Is it like the others? <laughs> Almost the identical pattern. Where was it mailed from, Dan? Originally from New York. About a month ago. I suppose that other business is in the Springfield letter, too. Mm, you mean talk about dolls? Yes. Yes. It's all right there. I copied down one sentence in particular from the Seattle letter and checked on it. What sentence? This one. That big doll in the hula grass skirt was broken, but has been sent on to the hospital here. I expect it to be repaired by the first week in June. A broken doll in a hula skirt? Meaning a warship damaged at Pearl Harbor or in the Philippines. 
and sent to Seattle for repairs. Yes. We checked the Puget Sound Navy Yard. At the time this letter was written, a warship damaged in the Pacific was being repaired there. Well, I guess that's it. Yes. The references to the dolls are really a code. These letters were written by a spy. Yes. But who really wrote them? When you think of an investigator working on a case, you think of him as working alone. Think of him as pursuing one course. Think of him as being able to follow only one clue at a time. When the FBI works on a case, it is true that usually one or two agents are in charge. But even they don't work alone. Far from it. Any other agents they may need, any other investigators they may need, any other resources they may need, are always available. In this case, field agents in Seattle, in San Francisco, in Springfield immediately began investigating the three women who had received letters sent back from Argentina. Began checking on their backgrounds, began digging into their activities. At the same time, the special agents in charge were carefully checking on all references in the letters. And the letters themselves were put through a microscopic examination in the FBI laboratory. How are you coming with those letters, Doc? Those dull letters? Yes. They're awfully dull. You mean you didn't find... I mean the letters are dull. Bad style, too. And all the misspelling... Don't people go to school anymore? Doc. I know. You want to check on the typing. Yes. Well, the Seattle letter was typed on a regular office machine. The San Francisco letter, worst style of all, that was typed on a regular office machine, too. The same machine? Not even the same make. What? The third letter, the one from the lady in Springfield that was mailed in New York, that was typed on a small portable. I see. Anything about the typing itself, Doc? It's terrible. I know. Same person typed all three letters, all right. He did? He didn't. She did. What? Whoever typed these letters can't type very well. Doesn't know the touch system. And the odds are it was a woman. A woman? Which one, though? Not one of the three who signed these letters. How do you know? We found every one of these signatures was traced. They're all forgeries. All signatures are forged and all letters are typed by the same person. Uh Uh-huh. Probably a woman. That's right. I don't think it's any of the three who got the letters. Not from the reports. Have they all been cleared? Every one. I figured they would be, but... Who is it, then? We've been working on a theory, Paul, that... Well, let me go over it for you and see what you think. Sure. Regardless of anything else, each of these letters has actual facts about each woman concerned. Real, honest things that they really did. Like the Seattle woman visiting her son at his camp. Yes. Well, the writer, then, must be someone who knows all three. Right. Now, what woman would know all three? What do they all have in common? I get it, Dan. They all have the same hobby. They all collect dolls. We found that they get their dolls from several places. There's one place where they've all bought dolls from and have been buying from steadily. What's that? A doll shop on Madison Avenue in New York City. And, Paul, that shop is owned by a woman... A woman named Cora Lee Williamson. The first clue is a letter. An ordinary clue, a small clue. But a year ago in Colorado, a clean glass was a clue. An ordinary drinking glass. That was a small clue. But an FBI laboratory examination of the gastric juices in a man's body showed there had been poison in that glass... This letter, this first small clue, leads to other clues. Leads to the discovery of an espionage system. Leads finally to a woman, a woman who owns a doll shop. A woman who may be a spy. I really must apologize to you. This office is so tiny and cluttered, Mr... Uh, Walker. Oh, of course, Walker. There. I hope you'll be comfortable. That's fine, Mrs. Williamson. You're not by any chance related to the Walkers of Mobile. (laughs) Not that I know of. Of course, it's not a very unusual name, but I'm always hoping that I'll meet someone from Mobile. (laughs) Oh, listen to me chatter. I'm sorry, Mr. Walker. What can I do for you? Oh, just a few routine questions I hope you can answer. Why, I'd be delighted to. How long have you had this shop? Almost, um, four years now. And you've been in New York all that time? Oh, this must be about my income tax and my account. <laughs> it's not your income tax. Well, I should hope not. After all, I pay that man. <laughs> um, 
What is it about, Mr. Walker? You're traveling, for one thing. Traveling? Mm -hmm. Oh, my dear man. This business just doesn't give me a chance to get anywhere. Except, of course, for a week or two in the summer. You haven't made any trips recently? Yes, I have. I was in California recently. When? In, um... Now, let me think. Um... April. Where in California? San Francisco. That's my husband's hometown, you see. You didn't go any other place? Oh, no. Seattle? Oh, dear, no. It was a very brief trip. Why did you ask? Ask what? Uh, whether I'd been to, uh... Where was it? Um, uh, Seattle. To be frank, I'm interested in some letters. Sent to Seattle? Well, one sent from Seattle. To me? No, to Argentina. Oh, What's wrong, Mrs. Williamson? Well, nothing except that... Well, Mr. Walker, I just feel you're trying to find out something horrible. Like what? That's just it. I don't know what. I haven't any idea, and that's what makes it so frightening. It, is that your portable? Oh, well, yes. You type letters to your customers on that? Oh, no, I can't type at all. You can? Oh, dear, no. Who does your typing, then? My husband used to, and I have a girl who does it now. Your husband? Uh, yes, we used to run the business together, and... Well, the reason I got so upset just before, Mr. Walker, is that when my husband and I were in California, he did run up to Seattle for a few days. Why? I don't know. Where is he now? Now? Yes. Oh, I thought you knew. My husband had a heart attack last month, Mr. Walker. He's dead. <laughs> We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on Coralie Williamson, spy. We will reopen this file in just a moment. One of the most pressing problems to be faced by our ex-servicemen is, what should I do about my government life insurance? Should I drop it or keep it in force? The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States wishes to emphasize that your national service life insurance is an invaluable possession. Don't let it lapse as soon as possible, convert it into one of the standard policies offered by the government. That's good advice. The kind of counsel that equitable society representatives have been giving to men and women in search of greater security since the year 1859. During those 86 years, the equitable society has grown into a strong, mutual society with 3,200,000 members. Such a society and the funds entrusted to its care is a valuable asset to this country, a great stabilizing force. Equitable society funds are invested in all types of business, from the corner store and the small farm to the industrial giants that have worked such miracles of war production. By serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on Coralie Williamson. Spy. Proof is a very simple word. Five letters, simple to pronounce, simple to understand. Yet it is the most important word in the language of the FBI. In detective fiction, the case of Coralie Williamson would have been over long ago. Espionage letters are intercepted. It is found that one person, probably a woman, wrote the letters... Circumstantial evidence indicates that woman is Coralie Williamson. The tough, tight-lipped, fictional detective arrests the charming, lovely lady. End of lady, end of case, end of the best-selling mystery. But for the FBI, only the beginning. True, a woman probably typed the letters, and that woman was probably Coralie Williamson. But there is no actual proof. Any more than there is actual proof that Coralie's husband wrote the letters. Proof must be gotten. And to get it, one name is sent out to the hundreds of FBI agents throughout the nation. Coralie Williamson. Postal and censorship authorities are warned to watch for any letters mentioning dolls. Over the entire country, a tight but invisible net is spread. And at the same time, special agents talk to anyone who might have information about Coralie Williamson. In the East and in the West. To seek, to search, to hunt for one thing. Proof. Then Mrs. Williamson and her husband stayed in this hotel the whole time they were in Seattle? Oh, no, she did. He wasn't here. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Tell me, do you have public typewriters in this hotel? Yes. 
Did Mrs. Williamson ever use one? I don't know. But she could have. Oh, sure. She could have very easily. Carly? Yeah, she was one of our bookkeepers until she left for New York. Did she do any typing for you? Only at the beginning. Bad typist? Terrible. And her spelling was worse. What kind of accounts did you handle then? Well, uh, <clears throat> we did have a few Japanese accounts. Did Mrs. Williamson handle any of them? She handled most of them. She was very good with Japs. Yeah, I lived across the hall from the Williamsons for almost a year. She was very popular with the Navy. How do you know? Uh, she was always going to parties. Theirs and ours. Theirs? The Japs. Every time they gave a party, little Carly was right there. I'll say she lived here. Glad to get rid of her. Why? Well, would you want a flock of Japs coming to your house? <laughs> no. Do you remember any of them? Yeah. One was a big shot in the Jap Navy. You don't know his name? No, it was something like, um, Kangaroo. Oh, well, I don't know. But Mrs. Williamson liked the Japs? Liked him? <laughs> she belonged to a Jap society herself. How long did you take care of Mr. Williamson, Doctor? For uh, two years before they went east, and then again when they came back here a few months ago. It was hard for her, of course. What way? Oh, they never had much money until after they went east. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until Mrs. Williamson got her doll shop started in New York that things really got better. Much better, I gather. Oh, yes. When they came back here, hundred-dollar bills were like water to her. Walker speaking. Paul, this is Dan. Hello, Dan. We just received a special report over the wire from New York. What about? Something funny about Mrs. Williamson's money. Yes? She's been passing out a lot of hundred-dollar bills. And she did it here, too. Well, the New York office found that in 1941, those bills were received by the New York agency of the Yokohama Species Bank, direct from Tokyo, Japan. It's beginning to fit. Go on. Later in 1941, they were paid into the account of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Was the account in anyone's name? Yes. A commander named Matushu. Matushu. What was his first name? Kanagoro. Kangaroo. What? Uh, I, I just thought of something, Dan. Is that all? That's plenty. Now there is the beginning of actual proof. Now the masses of evidence that the unlimited resources of the FBI can gather it piles up. The Argentina letters, the typewriters, hotel registers, office files, information. Information about Coralie Williamson herself. Her friendship with the Japanese, her sudden acquisition of money, her doll shop, her marriage, her husband. Every phase, every turning, every moment of Coralie Williamson's life is investigated. The mass of evidence gets higher, gets nearer to being actual proof. It still is not proof, but it might be enough to get proof from Coralie Williamson herself. I am kind of rushed at this point, Mr. Walker, but do sit down. Thank you, Mrs. Williamson. Still interested in my, um, what was it? Oh, a traveling. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am. Particularly since I found out that you were in Seattle last April. That I? Your name is on the hotel register. Well, I should think it would be. What? Well, right after you left, the last time you were here, I suddenly thought to myself, Coralie, you scatterbrain. You were in Seattle. I'm so sorry, Mr. Walker. It doesn't matter. And you know what I thought next? I thought, well, now, what difference does it really make whether you were there or not? Oh, uh, I'll explain that. Yes, do. Ever seen this letter before, Mrs. Williamson? It was mailed from Seattle. Why, uh, no. It was mailed in April. It was typed on a public machine. On a machine in the hotel where you stopped. Mr. Walker. Ever see this letter? This was returned to one of your customers in Springfield, Ohio. But it was mailed in New York. Very interesting, I'm sure. Mr. Walker. It was typed on a portable. On your portable, Mrs. Williamson. What? On that machine right there. We matched this letter with one you yourself sent to the same customer. My husband. Your husband wasn't alive when this letter was mailed. You see, Mrs. Williamson, we know a great deal. Typewriting isn't like handwriting, is it, Mr. Walker? What do you mean? Well, of course, I'm no expert. 
But I should think it would be impossible to prove that one particular person typed a certain letter. And now I beg you to forgive me, but I really am very busy. Good day, Mr. Walker. Good day. Oh, uh... Yes? Heard from your friend lately? What friend? That Jap naval commander, Kanagoro Matushu. Get the devil out of here. <laughs> Proof. A five-letter word. Proof. It's a certainty now that Coralie Williamson is a spy. The evidence is all against her. Everything adds up. But the lady denies everything, and what proof is there? Not evidence, not circumstantial evidence. There is more than enough of that. But proof. One hard, cold, irrefutable fact. Where is it? What is it? And how can it be found? We can't take this into court, Dan. What have we got? The letters. All right, we can prove that one of them was written on her own typewriter and she could have typed the others. But we can't prove that she actually did. No. No, we can't. Well, where to now? Uh, there's that money. The hundred dollar bills. Yes. We can prove that they were originally in the hands of Commander Matushu. Sure. And we can prove that she had them later on. But can we prove that she got them from him? Wait. We can prove that she knew him. Yes. We can only trace a few of those bills to her. She could claim it's a coincidence. Yes. Unless we could trace a stack of those bills to her. You know, they're all old bills. How do you know? The people she's given them to remember that. And if they're old, she must have a stack of hundred dollar bills hidden away someplace. Which she got in payment from the Japs. Right. But where are they? Where would she keep them? Well, if she had any sense, she'd keep them in the most obvious... Dan! Of course. You know what I'm thinking? Sure. Now, I'll bet that's where they are. If we're right, we've got proof. And we've got Coralie. Some women collect dolls, others collect china, still others collect paintings. But this woman, this Coralie Williamson, collects hundred-dollar bills. That's her weakness. And on that weakness hangs a whole case. Hangs the safety of a nation. Hangs justice. But where are those hundred-dollar bills? Where does Coralie Williamson keep them? Where is the final proof that she is a Japanese agent? Good afternoon, Mrs. Williamson. I've been waiting for you. Now, look, Mr. Walker... I've been bothered enough. I assure you, this is the last time. You have no right to be here. A bank is a public place. I don't care. Either you leave me alone or I'll... What? Now, really, Mr. Walker, I haven't the slightest idea what this is all about. But I've had just about enough, and I don't intend to answer any more of your ridiculous questions. I think you will. Really? Oh, not from me, perhaps. From a judge. A judge? Why, you poor man. If you think... I do. Mr. Walker, let me get something straight for you once and for all. You'll never get me in a courtroom for a very simple reason. You can't prove one single solitary thing. And we both know it. Mrs. Williamson... You can't prove one single solitary thing. What have you got in that safety box? What? What's in that box? Just... just some money. Bills. Yes. Hundred dollar bills? Yes. But none of your business. They're very much my business, Mrs. Williamson. In fact, they're my proof. Proof is a very simple word. But it's something that's very difficult to get. Once gotten, however, the end of a case is simple, too. For that end is the arrest and conviction of a spy. But what about the beginning? Let's go back to that. Let's go back to the first indication that there was a spy. Where did that come from? Not from the FBI, not from a policeman, not from any official authority, but from a citizen, an ordinary citizen, an ordinary American. Ordinary in one sense. In the sense that he realizes his duty and fulfills it. In the sense that he realizes that the FBI, like the government, like the country, like the future of the country, depends on him and every other citizen. 
No man can sit back. We all belong. We all have a part. We all make this country what it is now and what it will be in the future. You'll hear about the file on next week's case in just a moment. Will you join the Equitable Society in a salute? A salute to the men who forge the armor of modern war. To the men of the blast furnace and the rolling mill. And to the engineers and executives of the steel industry. All America is indebted to these men of steel. Last year they turned out 89 million tons of finished steel. A 70% increase over pre-war production. And in so doing, they help prove once again that the American way is a good way. And that free men and free enterprise are the backbone of this country. In 1859, when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States was founded, steel was comparatively an infant industry. It grew up with the Equitable Society and also with the help of the Equitable. For Equitable Funds made up of the savings of its millions of members, have consistently been a factor in the development of steel. Without this one industry, there would have been no ships, no tanks, no planes, no guns. In wartime, equitable society dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars. For you, your home, and your country. Next week, a crime against society. The confidence game. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Coralie Williamson was played by Joan Alexander. The music was under the direction of Van Cleve. Your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company.